first and most important thing I'd like to say is, is welcome again all of you to SAS, especially those of you from outside the institution. And um, secondly, to remark that um, those of you who spend any time in London and are, for whatever reason, forced to take the buses, know that sometimes they come in twos. And t today and yesterday, actually, we have, after many a uh, long time of waiting, we've had two lectures on Gallipoli, one from Professor Erickson from the United States, who, which unfortunately I was unable to attend at, at King's College, but it's about uh, his new book, forthcoming book, about to be released on Gallipoli, so I recommend that to you. And of course, uh, Professor Yildiz's uh, talk, which will come as soon as I get out of your way, essentially. Uh, I've been asked to say a, a few words, and they really will be a very few words. Uh, of course, today we are, uh, and this whole uh, cycle this year is about, in some ways, commemorating uh, World War I. And in this country, of course, what happened uh, on the eastern fronts of the war gets much less attention than what happened in the western fronts, naturally, perhaps. Um, so it's, it's welcome to have uh, not one, but two events that talk about things uh, from the Ottoman perspective of the war. Now, of course, um, the, the, the war in the Ottoman Empire was multifaceted. It took place on many different fronts. Uh, and unlike most of the activity on the, uh, on the Western Front, was much more fast-moving and rapid and, and dynamic. Uh, some would say quixotic, some of the fronts, some of the campaigns that were uh, imagined and uh, put into place during the war. But in many respects, it's understandable that Gallipoli should be the focus uh, for these um, commemorations when the Ottoman Empire does uh, finally get a look in. It's probably the one Ottoman front that rings a bell with most people in the West, and of course it's been popularized in the West uh, in, in film and is now, of course, the site of pilgrimage, especially by Australians and New Zealanders, for whom it has become a part of their national history. In Turkey, of course, there is a, there is a similar, if somewhat uh, different, dynamic. While in most respects the Turkish Republic turned its back on the war, as yet another failing of the Ottoman Empire, it was very quick to denigrate. It made a rare exception for Gallipoli. In effect, the Turkish Republic nationalized Gallipoli and sort of annexing it or welcoming it into part of its Turkish national republican history. It did so in a number of different ways. It did so selectively, because emphasizing, uh, it did so by emphasizing the Turkishness of the Ottoman troops, which was, of course, a, a military force made up of many different people besides just Turks. Suas Turkish Society and Yunus Emre Institute London for organizing this event and inviting me to London, and also to Professor Benjamin Fortner for attending. As he said, I will try to make a speech about what uh, we should remember as historians or as interested in history about uh, Gallipoli and Dardanelles campaign in the First World War. Now, first, it must be said that the campaign in Gallipoli is a modern war. So it should be understood in other terms than the, the wars in previous era. Uh, if we see Western modernism as a child of rationalism and imprecision, the modern war is also as a child of uh, Western rationalism too. Uh, rationalism we can see in military history as planning uh, in strategic terms, very big, uh, great wars, and organizing a mass army. So uh, here we have the term, as you see, battle plan, and these battle plans are like uh, today's simulations or uh, artificial, artificial intelligence products. What does it mean that the wars are no more, the battles are no more, one or two day activities, but one, two or more years continuing and uh, in a center 
organize uh, big human events like uh, Cartesian duality between body and mind in modern wars we have two sides one is think uh, in the bureau like a bureaucrat the general staff officer or the politician strategist and organizing and planning uh, the war from a center uh, kilometers long from the battlefield and then we have the uh, body uh, the practitioners the soldiers and the officers in the field uh, just in the battlefield so in a war planned from uh, a center uh, by a central mind we can say that the uh, planner uh, did not see who is dying where, uh, what it is occurring in the battlefield and uh, directs the war like a game like a war game so uh, in this case we can uh, <coughs> accuse Enver Pasha the minister of war Ottoman minister of war or Winston Churchill the first uh, sea lord uh, the first lord of admiralty for organizing such a campaign or for planning such a campaign uh, but uh, we should also not forget this is modern war and uh, war is a byproduct modern war is a byproduct of modernity like Holocaust is a byproduct of modernity. So modernity does not generate only welfare, luxury, uh, peace, uh, or scientific progress, but also that and mass deaths. This is an example. Gallipoli is an example, indeed, uh, of this uh, story. Now uh, we have strategic moments on the road to war. Uh, historians does not like. Uh, to produce alternative uh, scenarios, what it should have been uh, if there would be a, a, another strategic alternative. But we should uh, remember that some choices, strategic choices, caused at the end the opening of the Gallipoli campaign. One of them uh, is the British uh, government's uh, decision of sizing two dreadnoughts which were originally constructed for the Ottoman government and also paid in full amount by the Ottoman government. The Russians, as the ally of the British government, demanded this. And just before the war, uh, the British government in London sized the uh, two dreadnoughts, which induced the Ottoman government uh, to search for new allies, like Germany and Austria. Uh, Till recently, it was said that the Ottoman uh, Jean Turks, the Committee of Union and Progress leaders, uh, were German Phil, and uh, they consciously chose Germany uh, as an uh, ally. But we know now, uh, owing to the new books like uh, Mustafa Aksakal's book, for example, uh, on the entrance of Ottoman Empire into the First World War, that the Ottoman uh, government uh, attempted several times to make an alliance with Russia and uh, with France and England. But all of them uh, are denied by the Entente because they thought that after the Balkan Wars, the Ottoman army <coughs> is not a good candidate for making an alliance in a total war uh, like World War I. They also thought that World War I will uh, continue uh, very short and uh, will end in three or four months. So they thought that we don't need the Ottomans, the Turks. They will be a burden for us, not a, a supporter. So uh, let's remain at the site. From the Ottoman governmental correspondence, we know that this denial is understood by the uh, Russophobic Ottoman governors in Istanbul, these uh, Anton powers will divide us just after the war. So we should uh, make an alliance. We should need a guarantor of uh, territorial integrity. And who can be the uh, unique uh, candidate then uh, is Germany and uh, Austria, because Germany had a military mission in Istanbul from uh, 1880s on, 
uh, and Emperor Wilhelm II, as the third uh, article here, accepted Ottoman demands for air alliance in spite of the all objections of the uh, German general staff and ambassador in Istanbul von Wangenheim and the German foreign ministry. All of the German bureaucrats uh, said to the emperor, the Turks can uh, not contribute a lot to us, so don't make this. But uh, Wilhelm II was different than Bismarck. Uh, he is similar to Enver Pasha in Istanbul. Uh, he had an ideal of grand strategy, so he uh, accepted this uh, demand of Ottomans. The fourth is the uh, Allied Mediterranean fleet of Britain and France urged the German battleships Goeben and Breslau to take refuge in the Dardanelles. Then the Ottomans accepted this, the two ships, uh, into their territory, into their sea. Uh, and at the end of the story, these two ships uh, bombed the Black Sea ports uh, of Russia, which is on uh, 29th uh, October 1914, uh, and as a fait accompli, uh, made the Ottomans a site of the First World War. So uh, we can say that. Conflictic, uh, conflictic strategies, strategic choices uh, cooperated in the opening uh, of the Gallicola campaign. It, it was not only a plan of Winston Churchill, but uh, many of the plans, uh, directly or indirectly, uh, contributed to the creation of this fact. Also. Uh, the deadlock on the Western Front, namely in France, made the British government, especially Winston Churchill, <coughs> to think of a, a new attack, uh, of a new initi initiative uh, on the East, that is the Eastern Front, that is the Gallipoli. Uh, if the German von Schlieffen plan or the British plan uh, would have been successful in the Western Front, so uh, close the campaign in three or four months, then maybe the Ottoman state uh, could have been uh, found the opportunity to not join the war, or uh, we had now a uh, Gallipoli campaign uh, in 1915. The British government had different motives behind the attack at Dardanelles. Uh, shortly, I said that one need of securing tangible success to offset the bloody wastage of the deadlock already on the Western Front. Uh, so, uh, to force the uh, Ottoman government out of, out of the war, sizing the Constantinople after taking uh, the passage of Dardanelles. Uh, the other one, uh, you know, the uh, supplies of grain are coming mainly from Romania and from Russia, uh, and the Anton powers uh, were in need of uh, grain, so uh, they also uh, tried to open the passage of Dardanelles to get this vast supplies of grain uh, from Black Sea. Uh, also, uh, there was a two attacks. Uh, just on, in the beginning of the war, joint German-Ottoman attacks against Suez Canal, we know this as the canal operation, and uh, against Caucasus. So, uh, <coughs> you know the importance of Egypt uh, for the United Kingdom. So they also thought, if we uh, open a new front on Gallipoli, the Turks uh, will not then continue their operation uh, against the canal in Egypt. Uh, also, uh, there was a plan to open a new Eastern Front from the Balkans by the British war planners. So they, were, they needed 
the assistance of Romania, Bulgaria, and Greece. <coughs> These countries, all of them, were in war uh, against Ottoman Empire in the Balkan Wars just two years ago. Uh, but this time, they did not join uh, to the edge of the site, uh, neither to the uh, Entente powers nor the Central powers. With this operation, uh, London thought that we can get then uh, the Balkan states on our side and open a new uh, front against Austria. Uh, and finally, as democratic countries, uh, they thought, especially Churchill, uh, we can have a shortened war uh, if we will be successful on Gallipoli. And so our public, the British and French public, uh, will give us much more support than a long war in uh, comparison to a uh, long war. There were also Russian causes of the Gallipoli campaign. The, Russia, uh, the Russian government was responsible for the opening of the front, but did not give any uh, support during the campaign to the Entente powers. Uh, you know, maybe the book of uh, Sheen McKean, uh, McMeekin uh, about the Russian origins of the uh, World War. Here, for Gallipoli, we can say that the crying need of aiding Russia with a supply of arms and ammunition. Uh, also, uh, the guarantee given to Russia that she will acquire the control of Bosphorus, Constantinople and Thrace after the war uh, is important. Also, like Ottoman Empire as an agrarian state, Russia had a very uh, bad situation uh, from the point of finance. So, uh, Russia was in need of uh, financial support. Uh, by opening the Dardanelles, that is closed just after the uh, Goben and Braslau incident uh, in the end of the 1914, in August. So, Russia cannot sell any grain to outside, cannot uh, take any money from that. Uh, and so, uh, these economic factors are also uh, important and uh, had an influence uh, on the planning phase of the war. Here we see the Gallipoli Peninsula. As you see, uh, the aim is to make this passage. Here are minefields. So the fleet will uh, sweep out the uh, minefields uh, and go through till Constantinople, till Istanbul. Uh, from, uh, for the uh, land battles, please note that there are a lot of hills in the Gallipoli Peninsula. Uh, so any amphibic operation from this site uh, is very risky because uh, you cannot jump to the hills uh, in front of machine guns uh, very easily as planned in uh, London <coughs> or in other general staff headquarters of the Entente powers. Uh, the initial scenarios of the war was different than the real battle plans in the beginning, uh, and there were different voices in the British uh, war cabinet, Lord George uh, thought that uh, Britain can should use troops only after the Navy had cleared the Dardanelles. So, uh, in the beginning, uh, they did not plan to use hundred thousands of soldiers uh, in an amphibic operation or in, in a land warfare. Uh, also, Lord Kitchener, the Minister for War, uh, was against the idea of Winston Churchill that uh, land forces should be used in Gallipoli. Uh, that he also thought that uh, the naval operation will be enough uh, to silence the fort guns uh, of the Ottomans and then uh, urge the Ottoman government uh, to make peace with them. 
Only Winston Churchill uh, was defending the idea that they should also use uh, land forces. That's why after the war, uh, Churchill uh, was held responsible uh, for opening this front and uh, causing uh, the defeat of Britain and other powers. There, uh, among the alternative scenarios, one should also remember that there were a variety of suggestions. Uh, on January uh, 1915, just one month uh, before the campaign started, the naval campaign started, they also agreed, the members of War Council, they can land soldiers uh, to Holland, Thessalonica, Cataro, the Danube, instead of Dardanus. The Ardennes was, in the initial plans, not the only unique uh, target, but after discussions, uh, it was decided that the target of the uh, strategic operation should be Dardanus. Now, back to the past. Uh, in 1950, we have uh, another condition that Britain uh, had an alliance with Russia. But uh, we should remember, in the so-called long 19th century, till especially uh, 1880s, Britain is the main uh, guarantor of Ottoman territorial integrity and supporter against uh, Russian uh, threat. Uh, things have changed after the British-Japanese defense agreement in 1902, we should look uh, at the world politics from a global point of view. So when uh, Britain had the Japanese uh, assistance in the Pacific, then uh, the Turkish control in the Dardanelles uh, became a much more uh, <coughs> deniable alternative in strategic uh, planning. And then uh, Britain allied with the France in 1904 and finally with Russia in 1907. That is the, the reverse of all a uh, century long strategic choice of defending Ottoman state against Russia. Now we have Russia and Britain uh, making an alliance together. So Ottoman state uh, was kept aside uh, actually just uh, 10 years before the Gallipoli campaign, we can say. In old days, we have uh, the British advisors uh, who give their advisors to the Ottoman government how to defend the Turkish Straits against Russians. So we know that a lot of British naval officers worked under Ottoman service uh, and they were well, very well aware of the uh, conditions in Dardanelles, uh, which forts are there, what ammunition uh, has the Ottoman state, uh, what is the geographical and topographical condition in Gallipoli. So, uh, 50 years ago, the British advices for the Ottoman government, and then we have the Britons and the others uh, attacking Dardanelles. The, actually, the world of politics, the, the balances are changing. Some advices can be mentioned here. Uh, keep a fleet of ironclads and torpedo boats in an effective condition with a certain proportion of them ready to put to sea at a few hours' notice. There is a British advice uh, to Ottoman state against Russia. The Ottomans uh, had, they, they did that, uh, they realized this advice in Gallipoli campaign, during the Gallipoli campaign, against the Britons. Uh, they have torpedo boats, actually. Place the guns at the northern entrance of the Bosphorus, which are uh, scored with remains that they could be not be silenced from ships and could only be subdued by a regular military operation with a siege train. Yes, the Ottomans did that. And then the Britons uh, had to use an uh, amphibic operation against them. Use shear batteries, uh, high elevation batteries, rear defenses, submarine mines in the defense of Bosporans. Yes, 
uh, the Ottomans did that all with the German assistance also. Uh, it is a confidential report on the defenses of the Bosphorus and Dardanus by uh, Vice Admiral Tyron uh, from the Admiral to Foreign Office. The date is 1892. At that time, especially during the russia ottoman War, uh, we have writings uh, like Howard Vincent's emphasizing that the preservation of Turkey is closely connected with our highest interests. How do we then stand as regards the question in a military aspect? They also emphasize on an attempt to rupture of the present status quo, that is, uh, in a probable attack of Russians against uh, the Turkish states, it is probable that our Mediterranean fleet will be dispatched to the Dardanelles. 20 years thereafter, we will see another uh, scenario. Uh, Russians <coughs> and Britons are in alliance against Ottomans. We have also uh, have pre-1915 uh, British plans of sizing Gallipoli, but they aim not uh, to take Gallipoli Peninsula or to take uh, Constantinople, but to make a, a assistance, to give a support to the Turks against Russians. So they said that uh, the British fleet, which will make the passage mainland on each side of the Dardanelles with 2,000 infantry, that is uh, in uh, 1839, you know that hundreds of thousands of soldiers landed uh, in 1915. Uh, in another report that in any attempt to size the Dardanelles, the greatest secrecy should be maintained until the moment comes for action, so as to allow the Turkish government as little time as possible to assemble troops for the def defense. So, uh, some plans were there to size Gallipoli, but in an other strategic context, as I said before. In the event of the Dardanelles being likely to fall into the hands of a foreign power, that is Russia, a position at the southwest extremity of the Gallipoli Peninsula might adventurously be occupied by a force landed from the British fleet. That is what is done in Gallipoli 1915. The uh, scenario is the same, but the purpose uh, is different. There's also a secret memorandum, uh, date 1896. Uh, now, what has changed when it, when the uh, conditions, the balance of power and Britain's attitude towards Ottoman Empire has changed. In a memorandum date 1903, we uh, see the signs, definite signs of the changing of British policy towards Ottoman Empire. Should we, in the case of Russia occupying the Dardanelles, at once militarily occupy and fortify Lemnos, Mytilene or any other a convenient state stated Turkish islands? The answer is by the Naval Intelligence Bureau of the, the British Army, British Admiralty. From a pure naval point of view, the answer must be in the negative. It may be stated generally that the Russian occupation of Bosphorus and the Dardanelles, or an arrangement for enabling Russia to freely use the water waterway between the <coughs> Red Sea and the Mediterranean, so and so, would not make any marked difference in our strategic disposi dispositions as compared with present conditions. So, in 1903, uh, now the British government decision is we should not uh, need anymore to support Ottoman government against uh, Russia. Just uh, 12 years before the Gallipoli campaign. And uh, we remember the Japanese-British defense agreement in 1902. So uh, the strategic shift uh, of the uh, power plan of London from Mediterranean to the Pacific. Prime Minister Balfour actually uh, concluded discussions of the Committee of Imperial Defense in 1903 uh, as follows. 
I will only read the last sentences. The most important corollary of the foregaining argument is that the maintenance of the status quo as regards Constantinople is not one of the primary interests of this country. So we also see here in the words of the uh, British Prime Minister that they are no more interested in defending the Turkish Straits against Russia in 1903. That is the earliest document I can find in the National Archives here in London uh, about the change of British policy towards Ottoman Empire. Now, back to the uh, war. We have the German-Turkish alliance then in uh, August in 1914. A secret alliance agreement uh, was signed between Ottoman government and uh, German government. He is the man von Sanders. A, a cavalry general, uh, he came to Istanbul at the end of 1913 as the head of milit German military mission, but then he will become uh, the head of 5th Army in Gallipoli during the Gallipoli campaign. We have also other German figures uh, active in uh, Gallipoli, actually today is in Turkey and in Germany. We have no mutual uh, remembrance of uh, Gallipoli. Germans actually uh, choose uh, to forget the uh, Waffenbündnis, the military uh, alliance with the Turks in the World War I, maybe because of the discussions about Armenian issues in 1915. Uh, also in Turkey, we have also Turkish uh, titles uh, claiming uh, that the Germans did not contribute a lot to uh, the Turkish, to the Ottoman army in the World War I. But we know actually that was a, a joint campaign, a allied campaign, and m not many German soldiers, but many German officers were there and helped the uh, Ottoman defense. Uh, Amiral Yüzedom and Merten uh, were responsible for the mining uh, of the uh, straits, uh, also for the uh, straining of the fortifications, cost fortifications. Uh, Colonel Vierle uh, is also uh, another German figure responsible for heavy art artillery in Gallipoli. Uh, Captain Pierre uh, get the responsibility of the uh, ammunition factories in Istanbul, just on the, when you know Istanbul, on Zeytinburnu and Bakırköy shores of Istanbul. Uh, we don't have now these uh, buildings, but at that time, Istanbul was the center of Ottoman military industry. Uh, and First Lieutenant Erich Serno uh, was the commander of the Turkish armored, Ottoman armored forces. Uh, he is the first commander of the Ottoman Armed Forces, uh, Otto, uh, Ottoman Air Force. So uh, <coughs> he and the other German airmen, including pilots, observers, assemblers and technicians, contributed to the Ottoman land forces in Gallipoli. Uh, in addition, there were German engineers, chemists, foremen and workers who work with their officers uh, under Turkish service show, I think, as a Turkish historian. We should also uh, note the uh, German factor in Gallipoli. There is not only a Turkish or Ottoman uh, warfare over there. Now, this is a Turkish map, but I think you can get the idea of that. Uh, the naval campaign, the center of gravity of the naval campaign was this area. Uh, here there are the fort guns and also the, mine, the, the sea mines region are over there. Uh, the naval campaign started just 100 years before on 18 March 1915 and on that day uh, the British ships and the French ships uh, were hit by the sea mines here in this region. Uh, so. Uh, then decided to go back and take refuge here in this area and instead of uh, the passage of a naval passage of the Dardanelles they then tried 
to make an amphibious oper operation against the Gallipoli Peninsula. This is the uh, south entrance, and this is, as I said, the narrows region uh, with sea mites. <coughs> as I said, uh, on uh, March 18, a joint fleet of 12 British and French, uh, 4 French, pre-dreadnought battleships, they are old battleships, not dreadnoughts, uh, the tactical aim was for them to sweep the mines in front of uh, Kepes. Here. But the problem is, 10 days ago, a, a Ottoman <coughs> mine layer ship had uh, mined the region. Uh, the, uh, Allied powers were not aware of that and hit the mines then. Uh, therefore, now in Turkey today, we have the victory day for uh, 18 uh, March. Uh, in Turkey, a military, from a military point of view, a false uh, label is there. Uh, that they call uh, sea battle. But it is for the Turks, not a sea battle, just a coastal uh, defense. Uh, or sea mines, but we, in a sea battle, with the word sea battle, we understand that there are two sides, two naval uh, forces are uh, actually in a war. That is not the story in uh, the Gallipoli naval campaign. Now, uh, about the sea mines. In military history, technologies are developed only in, in processes. 33 years before the Gallipoli campaign, uh, an inventor, Thorsten Nordenfeld, he is known for developing submarine ships and selling them first to Turkey and then to Greece. Of course, you know, the Turkey and Greece are the best uh, customers of modern weapons uh, companies and states as a competitive countries. Uh, so, Thorsten Nordenfeld he proposed the Ottoman government to buy the torpedoes, sea torpedoes, and saying the bombardment of Alexandria by the English fleet, which resulted in the total destruction of the principal forts and earthworks erected for the defense of the Stand Harbor, affords a striking proof of the imperative necessity of land defenses being supported by torpedo defenses. That's why the Ottomans started to buy sea torpedoes. It's interested. The first sea torpedoes, sea mines, were laid by a British officer, Woods Pasha, the main uh, British advisor to Ottoman state. Uh, he is responsible for laying uh, sea mines to uh, Dardanelles. And after 30 years, uh, this idea, the sea mines against uh, ships, became a reality, a, a defeat for the British side. Now, uh, you all know the uh, details of the battles, I know, I guess, so uh, I will not uh, take off your time for this, but please know that the first uh, phase is the naval attack, 18 <coughs> March, and then on uh, 25 April, we have a British and a Australian a land forces a landing at various bases of Gallipoli Peninsula. In May, we have an Ottoman assault. A, in June and July, we have a stalemate. In, of, a, a, in August, we have a, a Offensive of the Australians and counter-offensive of the Turks. Uh, then further landings were made at Suvla Bay uh, and uh, at the end of uh, 1915, December, the Anton powers started to withdraw their forces. Here we have another map. As you see, th this is the first region of landing. And then the landings uh, continued in this region. This is the Australian New Zealanders Anzac region, actually. 
this is much more uh, occupied by the British and uh, French forces. Now, this is a war on land, sea, and in the air. So, we have uh, all weapons, doctrines, uh, and uh, organizational dimensions uh, of a total war, actually. Naval long-range gunfire on coastal forts, coastal defense by heavy and light guns, submarine and torpedo attacks, sea mines and mine sweeping, amphibious landing, trench warfare, and finally air reconnaissance and limited air bombings. If you go, if you visit the Imperial War Museum in London, uh, they have actually a, a new uh, First World War uh, exhibition. You can see many of the details, uh, including uh, weapons, the original weapons, about the uh, various dimensions of the modern war here, the uh, land, sea, undersea, subterranean, and in the air. We have here weapons of mass destruction. That's why uh, we had uh, 200,000 loss on both sides. Uh, naval guns, light and heavy field and coastal guns. Sharapnel, this is called according to name of Henry Sharapnel, a French officer, like uh, Kalashnikov, uh, he is the inventor of these fragmentation bombs uh, and the machine gun. The machine gun is, uh, had a very big influence uh, on the losses of World War I. There is also a book about the social history of machine gun. So uh, in a machine gun you don't have now uh, the old traditional uh, heroes and uh, conventional warfare in, an, in the age of machine gun. Now, an example for this uh, heavy coastal guns. The Australians call one Turkish coastal uh, gun as Beach Billy. We don't know actually uh, which gun is that, but here is an example uh, for this uh, fort guns. During the one year uh, of the war, we have always a search for building a symmetry and then a symmetry. You know, in a symmetric war, there, there is no uh, winners. If you want to win the war, you should create a symmetry, either from a point of technology or doctrinal uh, sector uh, or human force. So now, please look. Uh, Axio and Reaxio, fixed fort guns, then mobile naval gunfire against fixed fort guns. Submarines, anti submarine nets, mine link, mine sweeping, ironclad battleships, torpedo attacks by torpedo boats and submarines against ironclad battleships, aircraft reconnaissance, uh, reconnaissance uh, mining in the nights, so the airplanes cannot observe them in the nights. Shell and sharpness, sniping, taking refugee in trench. That's why we have trench warfare in the first world one, because shells, sharpness, and uh, sniping rifles uh, urge you to take refuge in the trenches. Long range bombardment, bringing trenches closer. If you bring uh, your trench closer to the enemy, then the enemy cannot use uh, his uh, naval long-range uh, guns against you. That's why we have uh, in Gallipoli trenches uh, of 100 meters, very close, maybe in, in some regions uh, 50 meters. So soldiers are throwing to each side food or other messages uh, so close. Otherwise, uh, the British and French uh, naval forces have this opportunity, that's why we have so close trenches in uh, Gallipoli. Trench warfare under trench galleries. You dig trenches, the enemy dig uh, tunnels and galleries <coughs> to explode the trenches. The war is a very dynamic activity, maybe the most dynamic activity of the human uh, 
populations because uh, war is just related with survival. So uh, when it matters around survival, people are much more uh, creative and competitive actually. Sniper char charges, periscope rifles. I will show a picture now what is periscope rifle. And machine gun fire, bayonet attacks against uh, machine gun fire. So this is the dynamic dialectic story of uh, one year in Gallipoli. Uh, as I summarized. This is a periscope rifle developed by an Australian petty officer William Beach. The Ottomans found also this one in the trenches and they imitated their own version. In Turkish they call it Aynalı Tüfek. Uh, so I tried a literal translation with rifle with mirror. Uh, so you are in the trench but the rifle is not. Uh, with a periscope he is uh, trying to see the enemy and uh, charge them the fire against enemy. This is an invention, maybe a bad invention, uh, made in Gallipoli. We have also periscopic rifles before, but uh, this is the most developed example. Now, coming back to human factor, we have a total war, a total mobilization in Gallipoli front. Uh, the First World War was generally deemed as the first total war in the Dondorfian terms, a German general. Looking at the scale of mobilized manpower <coughs> and economic resources, one can easily bail this effort as total. Uh, and we should also note that there are different patterns of total war on west and east. On the west you have industrial powers, but on the East, Russia and the Ottoman Empire is, uh, cannot be deemed as an industrial power. So uh, the potential uh, of two sides are not symmetric, are not same. Uh, the Ottomans lost actually the World War, not for not having uh, modern weapons or uh, enough soldiers, but uh, having a bad logistics. That means that uh, they cannot uh, sustain a four-year total war with an agrarian economy like the Russians. Now, there is a, a simple Google map showing the, the origins of soldiers fighting in Gallipoli. That's why I called my paper as remote countries at close ranges. Here we have Australia and New Zealand, Africa, especially Maghrib, as French colonies, Britain, Ireland, Scotland, uh, France, Germany, Austria. We have also Austrian uh, officers in Gallipoli. And again, a British colony, uh, India, uh, Nepal. Uh, so, between Australia and Gallipoli, there is a very, very big range, but Australians and the Ottoman soldiers are fighting here. 50 meters close to each other. That's modernity, uh, otherwise it will not be uh, possible because you have ships, railways, airplanes, and uh, strategic planning before all that. Uh, now we have a local war. For the Turks, for the Ottomans, it's maybe a local war, defending the country, defending Constantinople. But we have a huge metropolitan and colonial uh, soldier groups uh, coming to Gallipoli. Now, who we have in Gallipoli? Ethnically, Ottomans, but Ottoman uh, army was an imperial army. As uh, mentioned by Professor Fortna, it was not a Turkish army. It included Turks, Arabs, Kurds as Muslims, and Greeks, Armenians, and Jews as non-Muslims. Okay, we have a lot of Muslims as majority, but we had also Armenian, Jewish, and Greek combatant soldiers, and also many of the physicians were Jew or Greek. Uh, so, uh, as Turks, uh, we should be aware to not nationalize 
the uh, Gallipoli and the Ottoman military history, I therefore try to use much more Ottoman, the term Ottoman, not Turkish. Uh, that does not mean that Ottomans were not Turkish, but uh, Ottomans were more than Turkish. So uh, it's like uh, Britain, it's like French, these are uh, empires, that national states. So on the British side, we have uh, Englishmen, Irish, Highland and Lowland Scots, Australians, New Zealanders, Maoris, Nepalese, Gurkhas, Indians, expatriate Russian Jews. Uh, and on the French side, Arabs of Maghreb, including Morocco, Algeria, Tunis, French, Guyana, and Senegalese. As you note, many of them are Muslims. Uh, and here we have also Muslim Indians. So therefore, religious origins, if you look at Muslims on each side, Christians on each side, Jews on each side, Sikhs, Buddhists, and Atheists. So we cannot call the Gallipoli as a holy war, as a Christian crusade, or as an Islamic jihad. Some uh, people, uh, especially in Turkey, as Professor Fortna mentioned, uh, prefer to describe Çanakkale uh, as an Islamic jihad or as an uh, holy patriotic uh, duty defending the country against the Christians. But do not forget, uh, we have Muslims on the allied sides, we have Christians on the Ottoman side. Okay, mainly the Ottoman side is Muslim, and mainly the uh, other side is maybe Christian, but uh, there are a lot of exceptions which uh, will not prove the uh, rule for describing this war as a holy war, Christian or Muslim. So this is a picture of prisoners of war on Ottoman side taken from the uh, Allied forces. You see the variety. You have a probably African Muslim, uh, an Indian I think, uh, and Australians. So uh, this shows also the description before I am trying to make. Tommy, Anzak and Little Mehmet. We have this uh, descriptions for the British soldier, for the Australian New Zealander soldier and the Turkish soldier. Uh, a total war, one million soldiers had uh, fought in the small Gallipoli Peninsula. There were volunteers because till 1915 there was not conscription uh, in Britain. So the Britain army were uh, composed much on, uh, from volunteers. Also the, in Australia we, have, we see volunteers. Uh, on the Ottoman side, on the French side and on the French colonial side we much so, uh, see conscripts. For the French and uh, British colonial side, as I read the uh, testimonies of the prisoners of war, some of them are saying, maybe uh, because of fear, uh, that we are wage laborers, we are just here for a, uh, fighting for living, uh, because we got much more money when we joined to the army. So we cannot call them as uh, volunteers or conscripts. We have middle and working class people much more on the Anton side and rural peasants much more on the Ottoman side. On the Ottoman side, the officers are, we can call, uh, as middle class men, literate, but many of the soldiers were uh, of peasant origin and illiterate uh, people. Religious, what is the motivations uh, behind uh, the soldiers' behaviors. Please note that religious and patriotic devoutness uh, was active, but not the unique motivation behind them. Uh, especially for the Anzacs, we, we are seeing the spirit of uh, heroism and also adventurism. That is the first war of the Anzacs uh, outside of Australia. Uh, and from a philosophical point of view, I guess that this heroism uh, was an escape 
from the fin de siècle atmosphere of nihilism and mechanic industrialism. If you read uh, E.P. Thompson's, uh, for example, uh, The History of British Working Class, uh, or the uh, maybe the age of the extremes of Eric Hobsbawm, you can uh, get the idea of what uh, I am trying to make. Uh, we have small people finding uh, to belong to a grand narrative in the context of a war. Uh, and it's interesting that both sides using Islamic propaganda, uh, Ottoman side and the other side, because the Ancient powers had uh, <coughs> also many colonial Muslim uh, soldiers. So in both sides, uh, we see uh, this uh, propaganda of Islamism. And we know also from the uh, testimonies of the prisoners of war that the British are using Islamic propaganda and saying that you are fighting against the Germans, not against the, the Ottomans, against the Halif. Uh, and the Ottomans are trying to persuade the Indian Muslims, we are Muslims, we are your Halif, don't make war against us. And it was reported that some Indians uh, left uh, the battleground when they were aware of that they are in Turkey, they are in Gallip Gallipoli and fighting against a Muslim force. What is the combat environment? You know, from the Western Front, uh, the stories and the descriptions, uh, you maybe saw films, uh, the films and uh, novels can much better describe, but I have these articles, mood, wetness, mosquitoes and fleas, dysentery, malaria, diarrhea, the smell of corpses, what you smell, what you listen to, and uh, what you see, this, you smell corpses, you listen to <coughs> moans of injured and dying fellows and enemies, because the trenches are very close, you are listening to the voices of ballot booths and terrifying sounds of shell, and uh, there are always explosions, shells, and smokes of gunpowder and exploded earth. And also, we have the problems between the officer and rank and file, both on the Australian side and on the Ottoman side. We have only one memory uh, for the Ottoman side, which belongs to a, a rank and file uh, soldier, but originally a Muderis, a, a religious uh, professor in an Ottoman medrese, but he came to Gallipoli to fight. Because he is literate, he wrote a memory, but we have not any other uh, example for this. But on the Australian side, we have a lot of diaries written by rank and file soldiers. Both sides uh, claim, blamed uh, their officers, their own officers, for tactical wrong tactical orders using bayonet attacks against uh, machine guns, urged, uh, the officers urged them to fight unprepared, uh, the officers beat the soldiers, they are blaming them, they cursed us, they are blaming, and both on the Ottoman side and on the Australian side, we are know that some officers shot their own soldiers for being deserters. So, uh, under the stories of, under the legendary stories of Çanakkale, Dardanelles, Gallipoli, heroes, Turkish heroes, Anzac, uh, legendary uh, soldiers, British patriotism, we have also an inside stories. Uh, enemy, to see the officer, your own officer, as the enemy or to see the German allied as the enemy. Uh, the Australians are describing, are labeling their own commander as the butcher, the butcher general, because he always uses the infantry troops against machine gun and caused uh, a lot of uh, mass deaths in the Australian forces. Who is the soldier? Is the soldier a hero here in the Gallipoli? In modern warfare, the soldier is trigger because he uses a weapon, a mechanic device, 
And also in this case, you know the uh, famous Australian song, Digger, Dig, Dig, Dig. The soldier is also in Gallipoli, a digger in the trench warfare. So what is the front routine? I am trying a, a comparison between uh, E.P. Thompson's uh, daily life of a factory worker and a military worker in the front. So as I read the war, war diaries, I uh, saw a routine of activities. First, waiting in silence at close trenches. This is the first rule. Be silent in the trenches, but scream when you attack. So uh, to keep silence is very difficult uh, under the threat of explosion, but they are trying to do this. Periods of firing rifles and guns uh, between the two close trenches. Then explosions of uh, launch, long range guns. Then the guard duty mostly in the nights. Then digging new trenches, tunnels and shelters for sleeping. Then sleeping in the subterranean shelters, washing in the sea but under sniper threat, so it is not a uh, joyful thing. Uh, and in between writing letters in rest time to homeland in candlelight. So many of the soldiers on both sides same the same, uh, are telling us the same story. So it is not a, a heroic, free uh, war atmosphere. Uh, in Troya, in old Troya, so we have uh, independent warriors fighting in a heroic atmosphere against each other. We have a work discipline and uh, as we call it as a military discipline. So this is trench, an Ottoman photograph. They are staying uh, in silence. Do not think that they are happy because uh, to sit in this trenches and waiting for uh, being attacked or attacking machine gun owners enemy is actually not uh, difficult. There is Genio Bigarbi, Sa Genahı, Ucu Sipiri, so the uh, uh, south west uh, trenches, Turkish Ottoman trenches on the Gallipoli. So I made for you a graphic uh, which is circle of land warfare on Gallipoli during nine months. First we have long range naval gunfire, but it did not solve the problem. Then closing the <coughs> trenches and stalemate, uh, the actual uh, product is stalemate. Why are you closing the mutual trench trenches? Because uh, if you close the trenches, then the enemy, the British guns uh, close the Gallipoli Peninsula, cannot fire against their own soldiers. Then we have infantry bayonet attacks. In today's terms, they are suicidal things, actually. If we see today uh, such persons uh, attacking uh, the other side with bayonets, like in 18th century, we can call easily them as the suicidal holy fighters or thing, but many of the generals are not aware, Ottoman and British and Australian, that they cannot solve, escape the stalemate problem anymore with uh, <coughs> bayonet attacks. There is the responsibility of the officers and generals. They are uh, accustomed to the old traditions, that war can be fought with bayonets and with face-to-face -face -face, uh, battles. But in the age of machine gun, you cannot do this. If you do, then you will have huge casualties. So you have huge losses against machine gun charges. And then you are waiting for reserves and reserves and reserves and new ammunition. In Istanbul, all the graduates of Galatasaray uh, High School, that is the old, the oldest Turkish uh, modern school. He is the expert uh, of the Ottoman, late Ottoman education. But uh, maybe I can give you an idea of that. You don't have any more officers, so all the first and second class uh, students of the military academy uh, are invited to Gallipoli. So. You find everybody uh, actually 
for resource uh, for to send uh, as resource to Goripoli. The same story is also uh, valid for the other side. So this circle is repeating every two or three months, and at the end of uh, ten months, actually we don't have any victor. Or uh, if we call autonomous as victors, victors, we can call maybe call them as fearic victors because both sides lost a lot of men just in the beginning of the first world war. One. There is the trench war uh, warfare described in a German propaganda magazine. So you see the uh, autonomous soldiers fighting against uh, maybe African French colonial Muslim uh, soldiers. You have bayonets. So to escape from the deadlock of the trench warfare, this is used, but in every attempt, Australian or Ottoman, it brings nothing because nobody can win the trenches just with uh, violent attacks. I remember when I was a child the Iran-Iraq war in uh, at the end of 1970s and in the beginning of 1980s. Uh, we always uh, watch TV news. Uh, one day Iran takes uh, one fort in Abadan, around Abadan. The other day the Iraqi army, and years and years uh, at uh, at the end of the war, uh, the frontiers were the same. But many of the thousands of Iranian, Iranian and Iraqi soldiers died in this unlucky war. Here uh, we see actually a previous example uh, of this humans and machines in the modern war. And uh, Helmut von Moltke, this is the Moltke the Younger, uh, the chief of German general staff, he said that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. In modern war, officers and strategists can make a strategic plan in general staff bureaus or in defense ministries, but uh, more case saying is still valid. We saw the in Afghanistan and in Iraq also, uh, in Vietnam, that uh, no battle plan, no uh, military uh, planning, <coughs> can control the dynamic process on the battleground. <coughs> this is the casualties, uh, but you can find them also um, in any book. But there is the Ottoman death, there is the Allied death. Please defer between casualties and death. Casualties in military terms include also wounded and missing and prisoners. So uh, the total number, casualties number, is in total uh, 400,000. We have, don't still have no uh, precise uh, information, but according to Professor Erickson's book on the Ottoman army in the First World War, one, we know that uh, approximately 3 million Ottoman soldiers, 2 million and 800 uh, thousands, were mobilized, and here we have uh, one tenth of them is active in actually uh, or in the Gallipoli campaign. This is also um, why we call this campaign as a total war. Now, this picture belongs to the date 1918, just three years thereafter. 200 people, 200,000 people died in Gallipoli for passaging Dardanelles or for preventing them have a passage through Dardanelles. At the end of the war, Ottoman Empire lost the game, Britain won, and this is a Britain battleship. Here we have Romabahce Palace and Three years thereafter, uh, now we have the victors as the British man and uh, the defeated as the Ottoman. Uh, 
This is a nice picture for today's Istanbul because we have now always apartments and everything here. Uh, so a nostalgic one, but uh, my choose was for another purpose. What are the lessons learned? I am a military historian, so uh, trying to use military terminology, lessons learned and unlearned. They are peace lessons learned. One is that the United Kingdom, the Britain, did not attempt any other amphibious landing till the Second World War. One, they got the lesson that uh, amphibious landings are being suicidal against machine guns, but the Americans and uh, the Japanese actually got lessons from Gallipoli and then they used that in the Second Great War. Turkey did not participate at any big war after that and uh, choose a much more pacifist uh, strategy, uh, especially uh, during the Second World War One, uh, World War Two. Uh, Gallipoli became a commemorative space for the Australians and New Zealanders. Now we have in the Gallipoli this uh, statue, uh, a Ottoman soldier wearing an Anzac soldier uh, injured one. So uh, today, actually in Turkey. An average Turk does not remember Australians as enemy or Britons as enemy. Uh, we have always this traditional Turkish, Greek, Turkish, Armenian things maybe, but uh, it's interesting. Every year we are uh, commemorating uh, Gallipoli, but for an average Turk, the British is friend, the Australian is friend, the New Zealanders are friend, uh, maybe the Germans are not. <laughs> So friendly, welcomed. It's an interesting story. So also on the other side, in Britain or in Australia, I didn't or I didn't uh, read or hear any negative thing uh, in uh, modern times against Ottomans or Turks. Uh, so this is a good lesson learned. But there are also uh, lessons unlearned. This is the cathedral, the country cathedral. Uh, after the strategic bombings in the Second Great War. Germany, Austria, Bulgaria fought once <coughs> again in the Second Great War against United Kingdom and France. As Turkey, we are not this time in the story. We are happy. Uh, so, but the others did not get the lesson. Uh, maybe especially the Germans. Uh, total war cannot be won without uh, huge losses, as we justified as a lesson not learned from the First World War in the Second. Symmetric modern war has no winner, as we justified, for example, in the Korean War. You should create a symmetry, but you cannot do that because the two sides had always, in the modern times, the same weapons and technology. Uh, modern weapon technology does not guarantee victory on the land, as seen earlier in Vietnam War and recently in Afghanistan. <coughs> but we see that uh, postmodern armies, especially the democratic countries and rich countries, uh, still tries uh, modern technology, uh, modern uh, military technology in uh, today's terms on remote, uh, remote control air vehicles, for example. And uh, so they are trying to diminish their own casualties and win uh, conflicts, win battles in Afghanistan, in North Africa, in Iraq. But like in Vietnam, in Afghanistan or in North Africa, we always see that land forces are needed for a final victory. But if you also land land forces, then you have also uh, big losses, not the enemy. So, in the age of nuclear power, uh, conventional warfare, I think, uh, brings nothing but human losses. War is over, back to politics. Uh, the final victor is here. Uh, after the Gall Gallipoli campaign, Churchill is blamed for opening this uh, theater of war. Uh, there is a uh, Dardanelles Commission, the famous commission, just uh, after the first Great War, uh, uh, Great War. But then, 
you know, uh, he became the prime minister during the uh, Second Great War, and at that time he is Ismet İnönü, the prime, uh, the president of the Republic of Turkey. In that time, they are very friendly here, and after the war, Turkey joined NATO and they became a uh, member of Northern Alliance with Britain and United States. So, again, as Clausewitz says, uh, war is a continuation of politics by other means. We have wars, we have battles, we are uh, millions of hundreds of thousands of people dying on the battlegrounds, <laughs> but 10 years, 20 years thereafter, we have war planners together as friends. That's the normal one, actually. So, no problem. How remember, uh, Professor Fortna uh, resumed it successfully, but uh, I have also maybe some confirming uh, words about that. On the British side, there is a balanced field towards Gallipoli campaign, maybe due to a, uh, well, owing to a relative earlier rational confrontation with the defeat, the Commission, uh, and a a uh, well-prepared <coughs> academic literature using the British and Australian sources and also in some way uh, Turkish sources. So uh, the remembrance uh, uh, from the aspect of remembrance, I think the British side is the much, much rational one. Uh, on the Turkish side, uh, actually we have a more emotional uh, feeling uh, towards Gallipoli and in recent days much more nationalized in the Republican period. Now we have two narratives uh, in modern Turkey. Uh, one is explaining the Gallipoli by the religious and patriotic devotedness of Ottoman peasant soldiers, namely the Little Mehmets. And the second group uh, prefers to remember the military genius of Mustafa Kemal, who was then a lieutenant colonel, uh, active in the Anapartalar region, but later became the founder of Turkish Republic. So the narrative is much more centered around uh, Atatürk, around Mustafa Kemal. Uh, actually, the most problematic thing of Turkey is everything historical is politicized, uh, much or less. So we have also a Gallipoli picture, much more uh, bold size. Uh, still, the <laughs> Turkish general staff archives are semi-closed. Uh, the Australians and uh, the Britons had uh, written uh, their official histories, also civil histories. We have also general staff official history in Turkey, but it is not enough. Professor Erikson tries to fill the gap of Turkish historians uh, about Gallipoli history, uh, but we need to uh, use the uh, Turkish official documents, but still the archive is unfortunately not declassified. Uh, we have millions of documents in Ankara, uh, but neither the Turks nor the foreigners are uh, able to see them. For Australia and New Zealand, as Professor Fortler says, uh, the theme is a much more nationalist, the theme of a secular but nationalist iconography, different than Turkey. In Turkey, we have much more a religious nationalism. Uh, Gallipoli is deemed as a site of touristic pilgrimage. Now, uh, we are waiting to host uh, hundreds of Australians, they are coming with cruisers, Lux cruisers uh, from the ocean uh, to uh, Gallipoli. In Çanakkale, we have a big tourism, uh, military history tourism actually, uh, for the Australians. <coughs> so, uh, for the Muslims, the Mecca, for the Australians and New Zealanders, uh, Çanakkale <laughs> is the uh, site of Pilgrimage, but there are new studies, Australian origin studies, for example, Robin Pryor, uh, who revisits the legend of the Anzac, uh, 
Uh, and on the Australian side, there is the advantage of you, uh, ability of using war memoirs written by officers and rank and file soldiers. On German and French sides, there is a silence. Both sides have not produced uh, a lot about Gallipoli uh, and uh, the Turkish fronts. Uh, so uh, maybe they are much more interested in the homeland war experiences during the two world war war, two, uh, wars. But uh, for Gallipoli, actually I can read German, but I did not uh, witness a lot in German about Gallipoli, especially in uh, recent historiography. At the end, to the memory of all Gallipoli fighters on both sides, I dedicate my um, presentation. Captain Ahmed Bahri Bey, he came in July uh, to Kirte, uh, to Gallipoli, and injured by a uh, Sharapnel explosion, expo uh, explosion uh, and then went back uh, to hospital and uh, continued their, his fight till the end of war on several fronts. He served uh, till 1944 in Turkish army as colonel. Thanks to God, he survived the Gallipoli because he is my grandfather. Uh, otherwise, uh, I could not be here in this form. Uh, he is the father of uh, my mother. Uh, so I also uh, dedicate my paper to his and to all others, all of nations, uh, soldiers who fought uh, on the Gallipoli front. Thanks for your patience again. <laughs>